told me to talk about me. So that's, uh, here I am. Uh, I'm about six with my brother. So I was born in 1952, so this is uh, end of the 50s, uh, the baby boomers uh, post World War II. That's in the uh, very bombed out east end of London where my grandmother lived. And uh, born to parents who were determined, who sacrificed a lot in the war and determined that their children would have better than they had had a better life. I had free health, free education, had a wonderful, wonderful uh, childhood and very encouraging parents. And when I was, I had no idea what university was or a PhD. So ending up here, uh, Southampton University, I chose to go there to read mathematics. I wanted to be a medic, all the medics who are here. But in that, my headmistress told me that in those days, this was in the late 60s, medicine was not a career for women. She wouldn't let me do chemistry A-level, and she told me to do maths and go to Cambridge. So I rebelled slightly. I did maths, but I went to Southampton. <laughs> and uh, uh, that's where I met my husband, Peter. And I got my PhD in uh, automorphisms and coverings of client services in 1977. I, I couldn't believe that I got a PhD, and then what do I do with it? I tried to get a, a, a job as a mathematician. The first job interview I went to, I t was told I didn't get the job because I was a woman. That was in 1977. They didn't think I'd be able to control a class of male engineers. So, uh, anyway, uh, to cut a long story short, um, I became, uh, I'll tell you why this in a minute, but I became very interested. I hated computers at university, but I became very interested in um, when the personal computers came out in the 80s, uh, long before many of you were born, um, and you began to be able to put pictures and video and sound onto computers. Um, and in 1987, I went back to Southampton in 1984 as a lecturer in computer science, which was a, a my, math my, my maths professors were absolutely appalled at this. But I went back as a computer scientist. And this is me in Lord Mountbatten's archive. Lord Mountbatten uh, it was the last viceroy of India, cousin of the Queen, very famous. Um, his archive came to Southampton when he died. And this is uh, a multimedia collection. As it was in those days, I'm looking at one of the photos. And we were thinking about digitizing all the material and linking it all up and demoing it, or showing it to people through a hypertext system. And we built a system called Microcosm, which ran on a PC, wasn't connected to the network at the time. This was in the 1988, 1989. And it was a system, you could think of that as a browser, like you see, you know, you have a browser on the web these days. A document that lets you look at text and, lo and follow a link from a, one document to another. <coughs> Everything though was on that PC. And this is me in uh, 1994 with a multimedia workstation of the time. <laughs> now you've all got mobile phones. The sort of stuff we were playing around with in 1994 is with what you can do on your mobile phone today, accessing the web through the internet. Uh, I just got my chair, I'd been made a professor, so I'm cutting a long story very short here, in 94. I was the first professor of engineering at Southampton. Uh, this was a time when there were many glass ceilings to break. Uh, and um, I had met one Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the web, at a hypertext stir conference in 1991, the year, or 90, 1990 actually, the year he released the, his protocols for the World Wide Web. And that's the story from that time on. The, um, the web started with one website, his, and now there are trillions. And the story of how in the last 20 years, it's gone, 20, 25 years, it's gone from nothing to everything is basically what my research is about today. The fact that as a society we are now because the technology is caught up with what we wanted to do in those early pioneering days. Because in, in the days when I was talking about before, we didn't even have digital video, right? So the, the, the technology, and you can see as that uh, graph goes forward, you have um, broadband and Wi-Fi emerging at uh, the turn of the century, so that we can not only access this information through this amazing uh, invention of the internet and the web, uh, but we can access it on the move, not just from the computers on our... So you're all looking now at, at the web, probably, or Google, uh, or all the other, Facebook, Twitter, whatever you use, Instagram. All these things have come about because 
we as a society want to put content onto the, onto the web and tell everybody about ourselves. Quite amazing. And in the last 20 years, we have gone from thinking about digitizing things to being almost all information now is born digital. People are born digital. And we're increasingly going into a world where everything we do will be digital and everything we do on that, in that digital space, we leave a footprint. And it's really important to understand our memories and, and how we manage the information that we are putting onto this space. So my career in many ways has, has tracked, not, I don't, not tracked in terms, I'm not trying to say that uh, be, as the web's evolved, that's why my career's evolved, but my career has been actually uh, growing during this time. In 94, as I say, I got my chair. We were starting to use the web in those days. I, um, I, we were developing systems and applications for the web, and in particular, uh, the next generation of the web. But um, my personal career was, because I was part of this world that was becoming very vogue, it was in vogue, and politicians, once we got past this tipping point, and people started to think about putting information on the web, politicians started to notice and all sorts of things. I got a, um, an EPSRC research fellowship in 1996 and started to be known. And uh, for I, I was given a, I became a commander of the British Empire in 2000. I'm not quite sure which part of the British Empire I command, <laughs> but there is one little island somewhere. Um, and also, and this is a story about uh, almost missed opportunities because in um, 2002, I was invited to go on an Anglo-Indian science tour of a, a party from England going, from the UK going out to um, India to talk about science with the then Prime Minister Tony Blair, and that's Helena Kennedy introducing us. And from that moment, it wasn't because I met Tony Blair particularly, but I became part of the establishment. I met people on that tour who, I've, who because I knew them, helped me climb the ladder. And I almost didn't go because I was on holiday. I was going to be on holiday at that time. And I thought, oh, I can't. And actually, I changed my mind. I said, no, I will go. And that, has been, that was a fabulous opportunity that I almost missed. And it's really set me on the course for the rest because I love science policy. I love actually um, helping the, the government decide how to spend its money. Uh, <laughs> so, um, also at this, uh, so you get into the middle of the noughties or whatever we call them, 2004, 2005, and I was talking to Tim at a conference and he was saying, you know, the vision of the semantic web, it's not, it's not happening. I, I, we need to do more work on this. And again, cutting a long story short, this is a part of his original vision, that the web wouldn't just be linked documents, it would be linked data as well. And um, we were trying to think about why, with my colleague Nigel Shabbat, why this, this wasn't, the web of linked data wasn't take, taking off. And so to, uh, we wrote a paper that simplified the whole thing and said, actually, this is a very simple world. Everybody just put your data out there and link it. And 10 years later, that is that is beginning to happen. More and more companies are using this technology, and you know that we're living in an age of big data now, part of it driven by the, the inventions of the, of the internet and the web, and um, the basic computer technology and the power that we have. But in doing that, we were looking back at that graph I showed you of how the web had evolved in the first place. Why did it go from being one website to everything? And we realized that uh, it was because people do things with the web that this thing was very socio-technical. It wasn't just about technology, it's what people did with it. And uh, I'm looking to, oh yeah, good. And um, so we decided to launch a new discipline. We called it web science. And I always say there's two things I hate about that term. One is web and the other is science. Because <laughs> everyone thinks it's just about this piece of technology called the web and you know most people got the internet anyway and now you, you go through it now to get to information. And science makes it sound hard. Um, um, and actually, it's all about what people do. It's about behavior and how we, as a society, interact with um, this technology. It grows because of us, and it's completely reshaping. So, well, it's reshaping, it's changing society, and we need to understand that. So we said we need to study it from a social technical point of view. 
Uh, that's, um, the picture is of Tim, myself, uh, Danny Weitzner, who's a lawyer, works at MIT, and Nigel Shabot. We're at MIT launching this idea. And that, to me, was quite amazing, that I had gotten from that back garden in Walthamstow to being on the front page of MIT. I just thought, yes, I can do this. I can do this. Because I'm working with the most amazing people. It wasn't just me. It was a team of people doing this. We had a great quote from Eric Schmidt, who was CEO of Google at the time, to say this is a good idea. And it rolled around the world because Tim Berners-Lee said it. He's the inventor of the web. And we watched this story go and we thought, hmm, is anyone going to you know, take any notice of us? Well, they have. And this is now my passion. I'm actually, having gone from a pure mathematician to someone who um, is really interested in working with social scientists and psychologists and lawyers and economists, how this ecosystem that we've created is evolving and what we do to keep it for the good of humanity and not letting it get into the hands of the wrong people or the, wrong, the right people doing the wrong things. And so uh, I do more policy work. I get, I get involved with the, I'm on the Prime Minister's Council for Science and Technology. I get asked to be um, a founding member of the European Research Council. These are really exciting things because you're working at the government level um, and you're helping shape policy, science policy for the future. As a result of that, I get to see the Queen again. Well, I've seen her several times, really. I had lunch with her once. <laughs> it was fantastic. Met her and the Corgis. Um, <laughs> but uh, this was me getting my uh, dame hood. And uh, my mum is just behind me there in the wheelchair. Because she's in a wheelchair, she got a front row seat. She's 95 this year. And uh, uh, she's, of course, very proud. My husband's sitting next to her because of the fact she's in the front row. And, but the, the one I like, though, this photo of me, at, uh, one of the greatest achievements, I think, for me is to have become a fellow of the Royal Society. You have to be elected to that by your peers, your science peers. And when you get, there's very, there aren't many people get this, and it's um, uh, uh, a great honour. And you also, when you get in, you, you, you go to the, the ceremony where you become a fellow of the Royal Society, and you sign the book that Isaac Newton signed. So that book I'm signing there with a quill pen is the book that Isaac Newton signed and all the others who founded the Royal Society back in the 17th century. And they had the foresight to, to get that very big book, <laughs> which we're about three quarters of the way through. But, you know, that was so exciting. So what am I doing now? Well, we've got at the University of Southampton, where I still am, I run the Web Science Institute, have lots of wonderful PhD students from all different backgrounds doing this type of work. My, 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 the exciting thing for me is the global nature of this. You cannot study the web and the internet in one country uh, from one cultural perspective, one language perspective, one, um, one nation perspective. So. We have um, a network of laboratories around the world. We don't fund them, but they, they get their funding locally. But we link up across doing research and education, training of PhD students. And we're adding more. You can see we need one in Africa, and we've just got one in Australia. And that I fly around the world a lot, meeting people who are doing this type of work. And, and I have a, a simple vision left. I want to map the digital planet in the way that the physicists map the uh, the heavens and the climate sciences and map the physical planet, we want to map the digital planet. So my current project is a global web observatory trying to understand by observation how this web world is evolving and keeping it for the good of humanity. Thank you very much. <laughs>